Thanks so much for joining us today for our discussion about Equal Pay in Montana and in particular about the Equal Pay Task Force and their work over the past eight years. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jen Ewell. I am the program director of the Women's Foundation of Montana, a statewide nonprofit that is focused on economic independence for women and a brighter future for girls in the state. And today you are joining uh, one of our webinars that we put on for our powerhouse. So in addition to grant making and policy work, we also have a program called Powerhouse Montana, which you can find at www.powerhousemt.org. And it is an online platform that connects women to opportunities and resources and conversations with others across the state. So today we're gonna to be talking about equal pay. We have some wonderful guests who've joined us today. But before we begin, I always like to just do um, a little housekeeping and let you know that we are recording this session. Um, so just know that as you are commenting. Um, in general, we, we keep all of the mics muted for most of the webinar. Um, towards the end, we may open them up for questions. But in the meantime, please do um, both introduce yourself. We love to hear who's on the call and where you are in the state and also ask any questions you might have in your chat box, which you should be able to access at the bottom of your screen there and then see on the right side of your screen um, because we love to just have uh, the conversation ongoing there as we are having our webinars. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and introduce our guests today. Uh, this particular Powerhouse webinar is being put on by our Powerhouse Great Falls group. Uh, and we have with us Tracy McIntyre and Heather Palermo, both um, leaders of our Powerhouse Great Falls group. Uh, usually they might be putting on in-person quarterly meetings and sessions in Great Falls. Right now, of course, uh, we have moved all of our communications and trainings and webinars online. So. Uh, big thanks to Tracy and Heather. Do you want to say hi? Thanks, Jay. Um, hi. Uh, echoing. Hi, my name is Heather, as she mentioned, and I've been doing Powerhouse now for since almost the beginning, I think. So, um, but I do like how we've switched a little bit. I miss our in-persons, but I like how we've switched so we can reach a broader audience. Um, and I'm happy to see all of you here today. And I will be kind of lurking on the chat. So if you do have questions, I know Eric is watching, but I will as well. Um, and we'll have some time for Q&A towards the end. Hi, so thanks, Jen, for the introduction. Um, yes, so I'm kind of newer to the Great Falls area. I moved there over a year ago. Um, I've been part of the powerhouse group, though, for a long time, working first in the Kalispell area, getting that one up and going. And then when I moved, joining Heather and her team, which has been awesome. I'm also a member of the Equal Pay, uh, Equal Work Task Force. So I'm excited to have Ashley on board. And um, yeah, excited for the conversation today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Yes. And as Tracy said, we have Ashley Tubbs with us today, who is um, the project manager for the Equal Pay for Equal Work Task Force of the state of Montana. And we're so pleased that she's able to join us um, and give us a bit of a history and an overview of the work of the task force. Um, and after she's completed her presentation, we are going to have more of a conversation with myself and Tracy and Ashley, I also have the privilege of being on the Equal Pay Task Force for the state of Montana. Uh, and then um, we're just gonna kind of open it up for more of a conversation about equal pay in the state. So with that, Ashley, welcome and thank you. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for a conversation and a look at equal pay in Montana. Um, like Jen said, I'm gonna kick off. I'm gonna give some data. We're gonna talk about the efforts of the Equal Pay for Equal Work Task Force. Um, I'm gonna finish up with some recommendations on what people can do to help eliminate the gap in Montana. And then we'll have some just broader conversation and a chance for uh, Q and A. 
So we are going to get started um, with a look at the basics and just a couple definitions to make sure we're on the same page and talking about equal pay in the same context going forward. So first of all, equal pay for equal work is the idea that men and women in the same employment performing equal work should receive equal pay. Um, so the name can be misleading. This isn't communism. This isn't socialism. It isn't everyone getting paid the same um, no matter what they're doing. Um, it's the idea that people doing the same work should be paid the same regardless of their gender. And unfortunately, in most of the world, including you know the United States and here in Montana, we have not reached equal pay for equal work. And the result is something called the gender wage gap or the gender pay gap. These terms can kind of be used interchangeably. So the gender wage gap is the difference in the amount of money paid to women and to men for doing the same work. The raw gender pay gap is calculated first by adding together all of the annual salaries of women who are working full time year round and then finding that median salary. So that's the salary that's exactly in the middle with 50% of the women earning more than that figure and 50% earning less. And then the same calculation is made for men working full time year round. And then once we have those two figures years determined, we can really look closely at them and compare and calculate that pay gap. So nationally, the pay gap is 81%, um, which means that women are making 81 cents for every dollar that a man earns. And in Montana, unfortunately, it's worse. We are at 73%. Uh, so women in Montana are making 73 cents for every dollar that a man earns. Um, and this 27% gap might not sound like a lot initially, but it really adds up fast and has a huge impact on the lifetime earning potential for women. Some research has suggested that women could lose up to a million dollars in their lifetime because of the wage gap. So it is, it's a really big deal. Um, and it's even a bigger deal for women of color whose gap is far more severe. This slide, um, if you can see it, is a little out of date, but it gives an idea of the challenges that different minority women are encountering. Uh, one of Montana's largest minority population isn't represented on this graph, uh, but that group is Native American women, and their gap is one of the largest at 60%. So they're earning 60 cents for every dollar that a white man earns. Um, we don't have a lot of data on the wage gap for women who are impacted by disabilities or uh, for LBGTQ folks, but the little bit of research that I've seen, not surprisingly, also shows that they are impacted by a really large disparity also. So Governor Bullock knows this is a major workforce and economic problem. So when he took office in 2013, he created the Equal Pay for Equal Work Task Force, um, which I'm the project manager of. So this is a really specific initiative with the goal of closing the wage gap here in Montana. The governor pulled together people from across the state to participate in this task force. So it's men and women working in public and private sectors. There have been 42 people appointed to this task force over the last eight years. Not at all, all at one time, it's been spread out. So at any given point, there's between um, probably 10 and 16 people working on the task force. And this group has included university presidents, legislators, nonprofit directors like Jen, lobbyists, business owners, uh, just various stakeholders. In fact, we just completed a final report which showcases the successes of the task force and some of our continuing recommendations. So we're gonna give this group a little sneak peek um, of that report, which will be officially released at the next task force meeting on December 15th. Um, so we're gonna share that with you today, but just to kind of give you a little idea of what efforts have been made, um, I'll just do a quick little summary. So in 2014 and 2015, the task force put together two really large equal pay summits that were uh, just widely attended. There were, I think, over 300 participants at each. We had some really great keynote speakers. There were 50 business leaders um, that were on various different types of panels. So those are really big events. Um, and then the Department of Administration in 2014 and 2016 conducted a pay audit of state government that really put a spotlight on some of the gender disparities that we see specifically in government and made some recommendations on how to make that better. Each year on Equal Pay Day, the task force organizes events and press conferences just to really kind of keep the issue on people's radar. 
each legislative session, the task force supports uh, the pay trip transparency legislation. We've created a wage negotiation webinar. We've put together outreach strategies to engage the public. We did a film screening. We've done a traveling art exhibit and a statewide poster contest, um, just to name a few of the highlights. So over the governor's two terms in office, the wage gap has narrowed from 68.4% in 2013 to 73.2% in 2020. So this is really great news that we're moving in a positive direction. Um, but progress is slow and really difficult. So um, kind of, I would love to hear, or I guess see over in the chat box, if there's any ideas at this point, kind of on what is contributing to the wage gap here in Montana and um, maybe in other places. See if we have any thoughts. All right, well, don't think too hard because I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, yes, okay, I see somebody made a comment uh, that women's disproportionate childcare burden. Absolutely, that's a really, really big one. Um, so good point there, we'll come back to that. So I'm just gonna list off some of the main points. Like I said, there's a lot, it's very complex, but kind of what we're going to focus on today is this history of lower pay for women, which it kills me to say this, but our society really just doesn't value traditional women's work, uh, like caregiving and teaching, as much as traditional men work, like building and management. So well, women's work really has this history of lower pay that is continually perpetuated. Uh, we have a motherhood penalty, which kind of goes to the child care uh, point. Um, women are just so much more likely to leave the workplace than men to take care of their children, which begins this terrible snowball effect of being set back in their careers. We lose points for longevity when we take those breaks. And it's not just uh, motherhood. It's children aren't the only reason why women leave the workforce. It's also to take care of aging parents. So we have this sandwich generation that's taking care of kids and parents. And a lot of that just really falls on women and they, they leave the workforce. Um, and childcare is, is so big. I would also just mention that um, affordable childcare is a really big barrier. Sometimes women, because of this history of low pay, we're paying more in childcare than we make at our jobs. So we're paying to go to work and that doesn't always make sense financially for families. So women are leaving the workforce. So that's a big one. There are There is unconscious bias happening out there um, from both men and women, really. Uh, so that's kind of a, an eye-opener and something to be aware of. Uh, lack of wage negotiations. I saw that um, somebody mentioned that. Jennifer, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Almost from birth, men are socially conditioned to be kind of more aggressive and more competitive, whereas women are really taught to be cooperative and not, not uh, ruffle anyone's tail feathers. So we see this come to play at the negotiation table and where it is good in terms for men, not so good for women. So negotiation is a big one. And then also just poor workplace policies and practices like really rigid scheduling. Um, something I've seen as a highlight, uh, kind of a silver lining of COVID is that some of that flexible scheduling has become uh, more practical and has kind of eased that burden for women. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so, like I said, really complex things that are really difficult to address. Uh, and this could, I mean, we could go on all day about this and it gets a little doom and gloom, but we do have hope. There's some solutions out there. So, again, I would love to see if anyone has any solutions that have come to mind just after hearing kind of what the task force has worked on um, and maybe just some things that have worked for you personally. Yeah, having more women in management, definitely, that's, that's a good thing. So when we start to look at the causes of the gender wage gap, we start to see 
different levels of influence and control. So some contributing factors to the gap are more within our power to control as individuals. Some are kind of at a community and a cultural level and some factors really kind of needed to be addressed by our community leaders and by elected officials. But really there's work for all of us to do. So I think that's some good news. So we're gonna kind of work through this level by level, um, starting with the things that we have the most control over to mitigate the effects of you know, the wage gap in our personal lives. Um, we see that the gender wage gap starts to affect women uh, most severely their first year out of college. So that's kind of when this starts to uh, rear its head in, in women's lives. So again, when we go back to that discussion where we talked about occupation and kind of what's more valued and profitable in our society, uh, we see that the male dominated STEM industries, which are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So we really want women to feel confident and empowered to take those courses, to choose those degrees, and to enter those really overly male dominated career fields to kind of level those spaces out and just make them more inclusive. If you're past that decision in life, like most of us are, the next biggest impact a woman can make is that dreaded wage negotiation. Um, and in a nutshell, you won't get what you don't ask for and people who ask for more get more. And there are so many excellent resources out there specifically for women to make wage negotiation as painless and successful as possible. So inform yourself, go out and negotiate, not just for yourself, but on behalf of all women so we can start to move that diet women and men for that matter shouldn't have to negotiate in fact when I talk to businesses the first thing I tell them to do is eliminate wage negotiations because they leave so much room for bias so that's kind of a double-edged sword where I'm telling women go and negotiate and I tell businesses don't negotiate um, so hopefully we will reach that reach that point in that day where wage negotiations are not a thing but until then we really need to hone in on our negotiation skills and we are already expert negotiators I like to remind women that we negotiate at farmers market for good prices we negotiate with our kids to clean up after themselves I negotiate with my husband all day long. So we really just need to bring those skills with us to work. And like I said, there's so many great resources that we'll share for you. So um, no matter how many times I give a wage negotiation training, I find myself uh, learning new things. So it's always good to keep up on that. And then so next at a community level, mentorship opportunities are really important for women uh, and also continued pressure and raising awareness. We've seen lots of this happening recently, which is so exciting with the Women's March, the Me Too movement, Time's Up, the lawsuits all over the news for equal pay from the U.S. women's soccer team. We as a community really need to keep that momentum going to, uh, to achieve some long lasting cultural change. Uh, employers can have a really big impact on their community by utilizing policies that reduce opportunities for unconscious bias and also with policies that are family friendly. We see that employers with childcare solutions that support their workforce are not only more profitable due to like reduced turnover and litigation, they attract higher quality and more productive employees. So it's not just um, a nice thing for employers to do, it's actually really good for their bottom line. So we have all sorts of information on specific policies like diverse hiring, advertising, blind resume reviews that don't have the applicant's name on them, pay audits, paid family leave, flexible scheduling guidelines that are available on our website and will be sort of part of that resource package that we provide to this audience. So Finally, that next tier is working with those leaders and those elected officials. We really need to educate them and advocate for legislative change that will start to level the playing field. So I think the most immediate thing to be done would be passing the Paycheck Transparency Act, both at a federal level and a state level. Uh, that would be a big deal. So this is some legislation that the task force has been 
advocating for since the beginning. Um, and it feels like each session we get a little bit closer. Most recently in 2019, the chairman of the committee hearing this bill uh, finally voted in favor over past sessions when he didn't um, due to some pressure from his wife. It still failed, unfortunately, but it was closer than ever before. So who knows, maybe 2021 will be the session where we finally get it done. So keep an eye out for what bills uh, that groups like the task force, the Women's Foundation, Montana Women Votes um, are promoting and consider what you can do, like writing a letter or calling your legislator. You never know, you might just be the drop in the bucket that tips the scale to actually get this passed. And this key piece of legislation is a big deal because it would require uh, two things. So first, it would require employers to make pay public, um, and it would also prohibit employers from asking for salary and wage histories upon hiring. So making pay information public is so important because how is a woman even supposed to know she's being underpaid if she doesn't know what her male counterpart is making, right? Uh, in Montana, a woman can be reprimanded and even fired legally for simply asking her coworker what they are paid. So this should be shocking and appalling to all of us. There is a little thing called the freedom of speech being squashed here, and it is past time to fix it. So this bill would do that. Uh, and then the second part is that um, prohibiting the asking of previous salaries and wages. Um, that's a really common thing to do that most people don't even think about, but when we dig into it a little bit further, that is part of the reason why this lower wages for women is perpetuated is because when you're basing salary off the history and you have a history of low wages, well then that cycle just continues. So, Clearly, I could talk and rant and rave about this all day, but uh, as you know, we have some other wonderful task force members on the Zoom call with us, and I would love to invite them to join this conversation and open it up to everyone else joining us to see um, if we have some more questions and what everyone would like to discuss. Thanks, Ashley. Um, we do have some more questions. We had one that came in through the chat. Um, just, um, and we'll go and go through these first, and then we'll kind of go back here. But um, does the E, does the EPEW task force have a comprehensive intersectional action plan to end pay in, in, <laughs> um, pay inequality that we can educate and organize around the state and across sectors, demographics, and geography? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Uh, so the task force does do a work plan over um, that we've been doing this last year, and we're getting to the end of it with the governor's administration coming to a close, and we are about to embark on a new work plan where we hope to um, you know, keep working on those comprehensive action plans. Um, so much of this work really is educating and organizing and raising awareness. Um, so absolutely, a lot of that stuff can be found on our website. Um, and hopefully after this ne next task force meeting, we will have some good updates there. Perfect. Another question we had is, can we turn the COVID pandemic supports into permanent policies and funding that benefit women, families, and all workers? Yeah, so that is... I mean, by we, we can do anything, right, if we all work together and put our heads together. So I sure hope so. The co I'm glad that you brought up COVID because that has had a huge impact on women. Um, I think the two largest uh, ripple effects that we're seeing is, one, the closure of a lot of child care places, schools, daycares, preschools. Again, women were already stressed um, taking care of the brunt of those responsibilities. And we have even less resources for our children now. So that's that's been a big impact. And then I think the second largest impact from COVID is really um, hitting women kind of in those occupations that are more female dominated, like teachers, nurses, uh, restaurant workers, a lot of those essential and frontline workers that um, are losing their jobs or putting their lives on the line are really heavily uh, women dominated. So 
COVID pandemic has definitely, I would say, hit women hardest. Absolutely minority women who were already coming from behind. Those groups have higher infection rates, higher death rates. So absolutely, we really need to start putting our heads together and figuring out how we make some of those permanent changes. I touched on earlier kind of how flexible scheduling and working from home has really been a positive change for women. So I'm hoping that employers are recognizing how valuable that is to their employees and their work workforce and starting to make that a lasting change. I think that that would be a, be a huge advancement. Another question from the chat. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was just going to add, Heather, I think um, part of that question had to do a little bit with some of the COVID-related funding and some of the impacts. And I did want to just add that um, we here at the Women's Foundation received one of the business innovation grants, and that has funded these webinars. So it helps us um, to keep our VISTA and help pay for um, some of the presenters who spoke on some of our webinars. And so it has really allowed us to offer additional resources for especially women-owned businesses as they were trying to access PPP funding and for trying to pivot their businesses um, and offer, uh, you know, their business online. And so I think the Women's Foundation, there have been others across the state too, I think, who have been able to use some of that funding to create um, different kinds of programs and offerings that either were really helpful to women during the pandemic or are even enduring beyond the pandemic. And so I think there has been some um, of that, uh, but I think that was a great question, so. Thanks, Jen, that's a good point. Yes, thank you, Jen, that was good. Um, we have one more question in the chat. And we know that the 2021 session is going to be very different probably than it has been, but do we know who will be introducing the Paycheck Transparency Bill? That's a great question. That's something that uh, we here at Commerce are tracking very closely. Um, in the past, Senator Diane Sands uh, from Missoula and Representative Lori Bishop from Livingston, they have both carried those bills in different sessions. So um, I don't know for sure uh, who will be carrying it this year, but my guess would be one of those two. Thanks. Um, I was gonna go ahead and see if Tracy had anything she wanted to add since she sits on the task force. And um, if there's anything you wanted to talk about, this would be a good time. Um, not specifically, I don't think I do wanna just mention, I think that the childcare component of this is huge um, and that there's a lot of movement in the state of Montana to start addressing childcare. And I think that some of the discussions that we had at the EPEW, I always get that acronym and stuff a little bit, um, kind of helped prompt some of those conversations. And I would encourage everybody to go and kind of look at the Family Forward and the Zero to Five Montana groups efforts on how they're coordinating these discussions now um, from us. So, so everybody knows I'm the director of the Montana Cooperative Development Center. It definitely has pushed our work forward in looking at childcare and how we can support women and actually all workforce um, in this and providing better and more affordable childcare opportunities. And Absolutely. Jen, I you, okay, I was just gonna oh. say, I know you're on the task force as well. So what else would you like to add? Well, first I wanted to add something to what Tracy said, which is that um, our last uh, webinar that we produced in November was on childcare solutions. Um, and you can find it on the Powerhouse Montana website, powerhousemt.org. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely a time for innovation in the childcare space. And uh, it's great that we do have some organizations like Zero to Five who are kind of heading up that charge. Um, but it would be wonderful if folks on the webinar um, both educated themselves about that, um, supported that work if they could, because uh, it's kind of the next big challenge, I feel like, for Montana women in the workforce um, is trying to figure out the child care piece. It's always been tough and it's harder than ever now. So thanks for that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess um, I just wanted to say that I feel like uh, the equal pay task force has been really instrumental primarily in just raising the topic of the pay gap in Montana um, and making it something that I feel like 
is more well known uh, and that people um, are really interested in talking about and understand that it impacts not only individuals, but also um, our workplaces. I think more and more workplaces are thinking about equity um, and access. And uh, I think some of that is due to um, the Equal Pay Task Force's work through the last eight years and um, the different summits that we put on where we brought together people to talk about the topic and learn together. Um, and also just some of the um, programmatic work where uh, task force members have reached out um, to folks across the state to present on this and talk about this and engage in um, solution creating together. Um, so I feel like really that has been one of the big wins um, of the Equal Pay Task Force. Of course, you know, bringing forward um, policy to the legislature is important. Um, and my hope is that that will continue in the future and that eventually we'll have a lot more of these progressive policies in place as a state. Um, but I also feel like even if we aren't at that place, we do have um, sort of this growing group of people around the state who know about this issue, care about it, are really implementing policy change in their own workplaces and individual women um, who know about it, who are learning themselves how to negotiate, who are bringing these topics up in their own workplaces and making change that way. Um, so that's kind of, from my perspective, some of the big wins. So Ashley, I think, I think you hit on this a little bit, but um, what can women and or men um, do in their communities right now? I know we talked a little bit about getting to be more aware of what the child care, um, what's going on there, but are there other things we can be doing too? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like Jen, Jen also discussed just the importance of being educated on this issue, of bringing it up in conversation with your friends and family, keeping your eye out um, on ways that you can be involved with just kind of some like-minded groups, even just liking and sharing things on social media right now, kind of from the safety of home um, and participating in Zooms like this are, are really important because as the wage gap starts to narrow, kind of that low hanging fruit that easier stuff has already been picked. We don't really see a lot of overt sexism in the workplace anymore. It's more of these kind of reinforcing poor stereotypes. So I think calling that out when you see it and addressing it and being really mindful of your own behavior is, is really what's gonna bring us closer as we start to um, narrow. And as it narrows, progress slows down and it's more and more difficult. So just again, keeping up that momentum, keeping it visible in your community, in your neighborhood, in front of your leaders and showing them that yes, this is in fact important to us uh, is how we're gonna finally achieve this goal that women have been working on for, for decades and generations. Heather, can I add to that too? I think that of your course. point's right on, Ashley. I also think that it's important for all of us as women in leadership positions to meet that mentoring component that Ashley talked about. That's huge. In reaching, um, you know, watching in our communities, where can we get involved? Where can we start impacting and kind of saying, okay, look, this is ways that you can do it. I know that I personally, I work with a handful of different women. They're not, they're 20s to 30s and we talk about you know how do you go and not be afraid to ask your boss for that or to move forward or to take that chance and apply for a job that you may or may not think that you're qualified for but it gets you out there and I, I really think that some of this follows back on to us as women in leadership to make sure that we're leading that way and that we continue that work. Yeah, Tracy, thank you so much for saying that. I often think as women, as we climb that career ladder to like pave a way for the women behind us. And when we get to those positions of power, how can we um, bring others along and maybe make it easier for those, those next generations? So yeah, that's a really good point. That's a great follow in to a question we have in the chat. That's, um, do you have any specific tools to help you, human resource professionals influence their business decision makers. 
Yes, absolutely. So the task force has put together a little toolkit for HR professionals with some outlines of um, successful policies that have been implemented in other workplaces and just some ideas in general on how to be more um, equitable in your workplace. So that is something that I will pass along to the Women's Foundation and they can share, I believe, with kind of our follow-up email with that resource package. So yeah, we definitely want to share that with anyone who will look at it. Yes. Um, yes, please do, folks. If you have resources you want to share, go ahead and put them in the chat and um, we're going to, of course, be following up with an email with the resources from Ashley and also, of course, from the Women's Foundation. We have um, some other uh, one sheets on some of these topics that I think are really helpful, um, especially for human resource professionals, but for anybody, I think, um, as they're looking at workplace policies like um, paid leave policies and uh, child care solutions and diversity and equity solutions and all kinds of good stuff. So we will happily share those things. Um, and this is exactly the conversation that I love and that I feel like is happening more and more in the state is um, people just kind of taking it upon themselves to think about how can we create more fair and equitable um, spaces for everyone, especially women. Um, and I also wanted to say thanks um, to Tracy for bringing up the mentorship piece. Uh, it is key in the Women's Foundation conversations when we do research across the state with women. Um, that is really one of the key pieces that women identify uh, that they need in order to be more successful, I feel like. And it's one of the reasons why we created Powerhouse Montana. Powerhouse Montana is really meant to be a place where women can connect to either um, potential mentors, folks who maybe work in an industry they're interested in, people who have started businesses um, that are similar to businesses they might want to start. And so um, I feel like each of us has a role to play in supporting and mentoring other women as, you know, they really just try and um, break stereotypes and uh, create for themselves uh, the world that they want. Um, and we're all kind of here to help support that. Wonderful. There's a comment, question comment in the chat too, um, and it kind of goes along with mentoring and um, being transparent too and working with other women, but it says, um, what are some small ways we can make in incremental change at the individual level? The thing that comes to mind for me and something Powerhouse has discussed in previous webinars is normalizing the sharing of your salary. It seems like something so small, but this can be something both men and women can do together to change the taboo around one's income. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that is something obviously that we're, we're promoting heavily is, is that just getting rid of um, any secrecy around pay and just normalizing it. So that's really great. I often think that some other small ways that we can make some incremental changes uh, and maybe involve the men in our life is even at home, just really making sure that the household responsibilities and duties are kind of being fairly divided among um all the people in the home. <laughs> and so that women really aren't kind of being stuck with all the housework, all the child care work, and then expected to go um, to work and succeed there also. So I think even just in our personal lives and in our home lives, if we can find some gender equality and equity there, uh, that is definitely a great place to start, especially when we're all spending a lot more time from home these days, that that can be a, a big one. I also think it's important on this, you know, I was being headhunted a couple months ago and I went in to kind of find out some, what should I be asking for in wage? I called people through powerhouse people that I had met and I called them that were in similar positions. And I think that there's a level of people not willing to even make that request. So I called and they said, Hey, what do you make? Where should I be at? And had that kind of reached out for mentorship, which is kind of coming back to how do we promote people to make those requests? How do we get people to ask for the help that they may or may not know that they need? And one of the other things, though, is, is that sometimes it's not necessarily all about wage. It's also about lifestyle and that, that flexible ability of your, of your workplace and where you can go and what are those other kind of hidden benefits are really important, I think, when we're looking at wage equality is that 
our office has very much adopted remote work and flexible schedules. Um, we all kind of create our own. Uh, we work from home and we have that ability to do it as long as our work's being done. Um, and I think that that kind of helps with us being able to just continue to do our work, but also balance and maintain that lifestyle that we all want while we're while we're working in these in these positions and stuff. And then the last thing, I also would love for people to understand that you can look up for any nonprofit work, you can look up people's wages almost always, um, at least leadership side on their 990. So just sometimes it's understanding how to find that information or making a request. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, Tracy, about um, asking others and being more open to getting that information. And being mentored, I think, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, there's a comment too in the chat about an opportunity on a visual level to improve personal brand. And I think that's something that we kind of forget about too and the going how busy everything can get. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, this is from Jennifer. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that at all or if anyone else does. Jen, you should just t tell us a little bit about that. You're the expert. You want to? Sure, I'll hop in. Um, what I see often in my realm, which is helping people with their career strategy, vision, and then personal brand, is that so often people don't know how to talk about their value. And especially when in this gender conversation, there's sort of a belief that, well, the things I'm really good at are just common sense. And and so there's a lot of opportunity lost in conveying your value in order to be at that table to negotiate skills or to get job opportunities. Um, so I think that that's, it's not, it doesn't address the systemic problems, but on the individual level, there's often a lot of opportunity to change how you, you see yourself um, or you know, a person sees herself and then conveys herself and her value. Love it, thank you. And I think we still have a recording of an awesome webinar that you helped us with too on our website. So folks can go there and learn more about negotiating and thinking about your own value. Thanks, yeah. Jen. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And I think that Tracy also made a really good point about when we talk about wage negotiation, um, really what we're talking about is compensation negotiation and a compensation can be, you know, anything that really adds value to the, what you bring to the workplace. So this can be benefits, those can be those, the flexible scheduling, really kind of anything that adds value uh, and is a reflection of, of the work that you do. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about equal pay too. I wanted to just jump in too. I think this was mentioned earlier in a couple different ways, but I feel like one of the best ways um, that a lot of the women who are involved in Powerhouse um, really advance themselves is by creating um, kind of their own personal board of directors, if that makes sense. So their own personal little crew of usually women, sometimes men too, um, who maybe they do go to with key questions, um, who are maybe mentors or maybe um, just friends who they kind of count on to help them as they're thinking about, you know, I, I'm thinking about going to my boss and asking for a raise. Can you run through it with me? Um, what did you do in this situation? Um, you know, what kind of strategies have you employed in the past? Let's all talk about our pay together and be totally transparent so we have that information. Um, and it gives us power as we go in to negotiate. Um, oftentimes, your a little board of directors also is the one who helps you like find your next position because they know you so well and are your cheerleaders and they're um, out there um, promoting you to other people. And so I think it can be really important to kind of create that personal support group for yourself. Um, and similarly, especially like in your workplace, um, if you are interested in promoting equal pay, um, if you are in leadership, of course, there's lots of things you can do. But even um, if you're not in a position of leadership, if you know there are others on staff who also care about it, um, I think together you can go to leadership and say, hey, this is something we care about. 
Um, can we look at our policies? Can we do an equal pay audit? Can we look at how we recruit in our organization to make sure um, that we have you know, diverse talent pools? Can we um, look at uh, flexibility and scheduling and all the other great policies um, that you can find both on um, the Equal Pay for Equal Work site and then also on the Women's Foundation site. Um, I think that that's a good way to do it is to kind of create that community of folks who want to work together on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that board of directors. I wrote that down and I need to find, I need to put my people to work. <laughs> Are there any other questions, comments? I personally just wanna say thank you, Ashley, for doing this. I had heard a little bit about the task force throughout the years and also knowing Tracy and Jen, but having that overview and knowing what's happening was very helpful. So thank you for spending some time today doing that and then answering a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> Yes, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Um, and I'm excited to sh share the final report with everyone so you guys can just really dive deep kind of into the task force and everything that we've been doing and more thoroughly review some of these recommendations and what folks can do. So thank you so much for letting me share this. Great. So thanks everyone. Um, I think unless there are other questions, we will just wrap up here, but we do so appreciate each of you, your interest in this issue, um, your own personal advocacy in your homes and in your workplaces and communities um, in this area. And do stay tuned both through, to, through the Equal Pay website and the Women's Foundation website to see um, what our next steps and other ways in which you can kind of join us in advocating for equity for Montana women. Um, and thank you to Powerhouse Great Falls and Ashley. We appreciate you. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>